The following KQED production was produced in high definition. Tonight on Quest, from software to biotechnology, California's economy is increasingly driven by innovation. But when it comes to science education, the Golden State's public schools languish near the bottom of the national rankings. Join Quest tonight for a half-hour special on California's science education struggles. Meet top teachers and learn about some of the innovative programs aimed at turning around our poor science grades. Major funding for Quest is provided by the National Science Foundation. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, investing in partnerships for environmental conservation, science, and the San Francisco Bay Area. The Richard and Rhoda Goldman Foundation, celebrating more than 50 years of innovative grant making. And the Amgen Foundation. Additional support provided by the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the William K. Bowes Jr. Foundation, Ann S. Bowers, the Robert Noyce Trust, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, and the Vadez Family Foundation. Support is also provided by <laughs> yes, it's always it's like Christmas when you get new packages of materials and things. Third grade teacher Joyce Craig is preparing the science laboratory for her incoming class at Henry Haight Elementary School in the city of Alameda. We'll be looking at the geology of the earth and that's why we're starting with our rocks. On the first day of science class, her lab is ready to go. Science journals, something to write with, and then over to science lab. You can put it in the center of your table. Okay. It's going to be your job to look carefully at these rocks and to observe them and to see what they're about and write a small description about the rock. It turned into dust. Oh my gosh, why? Because they're making little rocks together. Do you think rocks I think the most exciting thing in teaching science is just watching the kids go, whoa, look at that. Um, and just that excitement that they get, it just energizes you. Joyce Craig's new science lab is the only one in her district's nine elementary schools, and it took her 20 years to get a room large enough to hold it. Her students now get about five hours of science instruction each week, and they're very lucky. A 2007 survey found that 80% of Bay Area elementary school teachers spent less than one hour a week teaching science. That's half the national average. And the report, compiled by the University of California Berkeley's Lawrence Hall of Science, had other bad news. The report is pretty shocking because it says that so little time is being spent on science in Bay Area classrooms that teachers feel woefully underprepared to do what we're asking them to do in the classroom, that they get little to no support and that districts and the school system aren't adequately either staffed or funded to do anything about it. The report found that while most Bay Area elementary school teachers feel very well prepared to teach language and math, 40% of them feel ill-equipped to teach science. The teachers are afraid of it. You see a big kit and you see all of this stuff and you think, oh my goodness, what do I do with it? Teachers also favor language and math because school funding is tied to the results of state and federal tests in those areas. The hope is that a fifth grade state science test added in 2004 might bring more balance. And balance is needed. Experts point out that with growing industries like biotechnology, computer science, and renewable energy, California sorely needs homegrown scientists to keep the state economy competitive. 
And on a more fundamental level, studying science makes kids better thinkers. Science learning um, really helps kids develop certain process skills and understandings about the world around them that are critical to how they think and learn. Okay, Dylan, what did you find out? When I rubbed the gray rock on the black paper, um, it made chalk. It feels sort of like chalk. So this rock must be in some place dusty. The kids absolutely love it. Last year I was told by three different students that they now want to be scientists. I want to be a paleontologist and a marine biologist. Either one. Top business leaders say that educating and keeping these new scientists in the Bay Area is crucial to its economy. Once, China and India were reliable sources of personnel for Silicon Valley's multi-billion dollar high-tech and biotech companies. But these countries have been booming economically, and as a result, more of their engineers and scientists now choose not to immigrate to the United States. And as this source of science expertise dries up, California will now be forced to raise its own crop. Sometime in 2007, I went to visit our Indian site, and there were about, probably then, close to 700 people in the audience Adobe employees. And I asked how many of them wanted to come to the United States. Not one hand went up. The Bay Area, economically, would be much different without corporations like Adobe and Google and Apple. We are critical to our economy, and it's important that we have a public education system that reflects how critical we are. California's science education problems have been shaped by historical forces, which have created a public education system that spends roughly $8,000 per pupil each year. That's less than the national average. The state's low per pupil spending was an unintended consequence of a civil rights court case called Serrano versus Priest. In the 1970s, the California Supreme Court ruled that funding public education through local property taxes was unconstitutional because it created unequally funded school districts. To comply with the ruling, the state legislature essentially lumped property taxes into one centralized pool and redistributed them equally. When you equalize spending between high and low spending districts, you have two choices. You can bring the bottom spending districts up close to the top. That's what the people who uh, brought the lawsuit envisioned, that all oh, everybody would be spending near Palo Alto and Beverly Hills. The other way to solve this equalization problem is you bring the top down to the middle and you bring the middle the bottom up somewhat. You ready? All of Ms. Rosman. As it turned out, in response to rising home values, voters capped property taxes by passing Proposition 13 in 1978. As a result, the state ended up with significantly less money to spread around. So we equalized down, uh, and uh, in that way, we led to what I have called equalized mediocrity. Class sizes increased. The length of the school day was cut down. The number of uh, teachers for special programs was cut. Uh, laboratories for science were cut. We had essentially cut everything we could uh, without eliminating all the basic classroom teachers. Ignition sequence start. At the same time, the emphasis that the federal government had placed on science education started during the 1950s space race was waning. The 12-foot-high Sputnik 3 weighs a ton and a half, 100 times heavier than the largest of America's three satellites. It's an impressive indication of Russia's major strides in science and industry. During the Cold War, there was this big competition, uh, not only as far as the war machine was concerned, but as far as supporting education was concerned. The bottom has fallen out of all of that. Limited funding has helped to create a system where most of California's public school students are outperformed by their peers around the country. Shake off the dirt. The high end of education in California, the top 10, 15 percent, are competitive nationally and are doing quite well. On the other hand, the low end in the middle of California are very weak. On national assessment of educational progress tests, called the Nation's Report Card, 
California on every subject is between 39th or 45th in the country. Beyond its failures, part of California's struggle to educate students in the sciences is an unintended result of economic success. In boom times, it's harder to lure science majors to teach in high schools and keep them there. Sometimes it takes a teacher to inspire others to teach. It's the second week of classes at Hayward High School, and Charles Martin is getting ready to teach his advanced placement biology class. Dr. Martin, as his students call him, taught at UC Berkeley for 12 years and was the head of the Peace Corps in Liberia. After retiring, he started the AP biology class at Hayward High. I'd always planned at some point in my life to go back to pre-college teaching, uh, primarily because I felt there was a need. And I had some pretty outstanding high school teachers and I always wanted to emulate them. Today we're going to have Strawberry DNA Day. And uh, Christina is going to give you some directions. Today, he has a special assistant, one of his former students, Christina Minor. Um, once you pour the strawberry juice, the filtered strawberry juice in the tube, you are then going to be adding about 10 to 15 milliliters of alcohol, okay? And then I want you guys to write down your observations because you're gonna see some really cool stuff happen quickly. Neither of my parents attended college. When I attended Hayward, it was low resource and low performing as far as standardized tests are concerned. But there are teachers here that truly care about their students and that really wanna make a difference on this campus. Martin encouraged Christina's interest in science and helped her pursue it at UC Berkeley. He wrote me a letter of recommendation, which actually helped me receive a full financial needs scholarship at UC Berkeley to pursue a science degree. If you're unsure of the words and the descriptions, look at the front board. Two years into her environmental sciences studies, Miner entered a program called CalTeach, which encourages University of California science and math undergrads to go into teaching. The program's aim is to produce 1,000 K through 12 teachers a year by 2010. Miner will be in the first crop. I want students to feel like any of them can understand the concepts, that any of them can relate the material and apply it to their everyday life. Um, and I thought that I could be a big part and a big factor in the students' lives in this moment of discovery. For the past two years, Miner has been apprenticing with Martin. Well, I think she'll make an excellent science teacher. I think she's coming into a situation realistically. Uh, she knows that she's not going to have uh, immediate response, uh, that she's going to have to work at it. Uh, with youngsters who may come into her classes with uh, skill levels that are below expectations. Further complicating the state's task is its high levels of immigration. 25% of California's 6 million public school students are classified as English learners. Poor English language skills make it harder for them to learn science. And Christina might face other hurdles as she embarks on her teaching career, like a dearth of funding in many school districts for continuing teacher training. Even Miner's mentor, who has a PhD in biology, feels that continuous training is essential for science teachers. Woo, yes. Although I've come with uh, fairly good credentials, at the same time, you also want to keep up. And I've spent three summers at Stanford studying and being updated on what's going on in terms of AP biology. So that's been really very exciting. Uh, parachutes and other real simple experiments and they're really pretty. Science museums like the Lawrence Hall of Science, San Francisco's Exploratorium, and Oakland Chabot Space and Science Center also offer teachers summer science courses. But these relatively small programs reach only a few teachers. Take the two tapes. 
you put them together. And for elementary school teachers who have to teach many different subjects, spending a summer on science is an even bigger luxury. In 2007, the Lawrence Hall of Science found that 70% of Bay Area elementary school teachers said they had spent less than six hours over the past three years updating their science knowledge. Positive attracted, negatives repelled, this is negative. Despite his enthusiasm and the $2,500 of his own money he invests in his lab every year, Charles Martin and the rest of the Bay Area science teachers continue to face forces that make it difficult for their students to succeed. And if success can be measured by tests, Hayward High School students continue to fall behind. Only 18% of its students scored proficient or above in science. That's half the state's average. The teachers who are here that stay in this high school are committed to solving the problem, but it is an extraordinary problem to solve. But as science education in the classroom has slipped, dozens of Bay Area organizations have picked up some of the slack by offering programs that expose kids to science in more informal settings. Informal education essentially is anything outside the classroom, any form of education that is conducted outside the classroom. So uh, museums, science centers, uh, technology centers, libraries, um, youth groups. The Girl Scouts have long been leaders in this type of informal education. Now they have partnered with NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View on a new project called Launch into Technology. So Launch into Technology is a week-long residential program that was developed to engage girls in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what we call STEM education. Uh, when we started three years ago, we had two programs. One was on robotics, one was on aeronautics, and last year we added astrobiology. Hi there. Welcome to the lab. Come on in. At NASA's Astrobiology Lab, scientist Brad Bebout introduces the scouts to early life on Earth. So why would NASA be interested in these? Anybody have any ideas about that? Uh, well, this could be the sort of life that we found on another planet. If yep. we're looking for life, it's probably similar to what we find. And so we study early life on Earth as examples of what to look for on other planets. Somebody asked, in addition to being um, pioneers in the field of astrobiology, NASA also leads the way in engineering. At the robotics lab, Launch into Technology gives the Girl Scouts a crash course in building robots. We need two of these collars right here with the tightening. I need to put the wheels on first. It gives them the basic concepts behind engineering. They build a basic robot. They learn a little bit more about engineering, and then they sit down and they themselves decide the rules of the game that they're going to play at the end of the week. And then they have to design a robot that can meet the rules and compete in that game at the end oh, of the shoot. week. Sorry. And so they get, they get to step through the entire engineering design process. The Girl Scouts are not alone. The California Academy of Sciences, the Tech Museum of San Jose, the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and many others offer rich informal education programs for kids, often at very little or no cost. One group called Youth Science Institute, or YSI, in Santa Clara County mixes exploration and nature to get kids excited about science. Each year, roughly 30,000 preschool through high school age students participate in hands-on science. By making science fun, they hope the learning will stick. We reach out to these kids and they get it, that they really have a great time, they enjoy it, and they turn around and say, I'm going to be an engineer because of my experience at NASA. Light, right. So these are all photosynthetic ecosystems. It's pretty clear that and immersive, field-oriented science learning can be very effective at getting kids interested in science. So why aren't more of these informal methods applied in our public schools? Who would like to show how we work quietly in a reading room? Well, most traditional classrooms are still modeled after 20th century learning. Teacher up at the blackboard, students sitting in rows taking notes. Today, many educators are pushing for schools to evolve with the times. Things have changed, um, but schools haven't. Schools are structured for the industrial era, and we are long gone from the industrial era. 
And we either are faced with changing the way that we design our schools and kids teach and learn, or our young people are not going to have jobs. As we've seen, some public school science teachers do get their students excited about science using sheer strength of will. But what if schools made science education even more immersive, more hands-on? That's what City Arts and Technology High School in San Francisco is doing. The charter school's curriculum is designed around project-based learning concepts. The idea is to integrate science with math, English, social studies, and other subjects by combining combining them Staples. in broad projects. Staples. For many students, Staples. this makes the relationship Staples. between science and the real world much uh, less the abstract. Process. All right. Which is the next step? I hated science, and I didn't want anything to do with it, and because it, it just was never accessible to me. I didn't understand how labs related to the book or what the text meant, and um, I know some my other some friends from other schools still hate science because of that same reason. It just, it's just a book to them. When I came here, it? it all just started to make sense. Like, it all comes together. And it actually got me excited about science. So I want you to get those three... The students kids. are still held to rigorous academic standards, taking Maybe tests and writing there. papers. But at its base, this is not about learning strictly from a book, but about a new level of engagement. It's about, you know, the way you learn it. Like, I learned science from a book, and it wasn't interesting. And I learned the same things from an excited teacher with tools and a lab. and. I mean, that changed it. That was when I realized, like, this is really cool. This, this is fun. One project last year was an assignment called Bill Nye and I. The Bill Nye and I project, first and foremost, was designed so that students would produce a kind of a high-quality, college-level scientific research paper. But this was no ordinary paper. The students needed to produce a short educational video as part of a scientific lesson plan they created for younger elementary school students. One group created a character called Captain Labcoat, and she had a pirate hat on and a white lab coat and this hokey backdrop and with an eye patch, and she kind of jumps in front of the camera and, and starts sort of you know, delivering something that she knew uh, an eight-year-old was going to love. If their parents were the audience, there's no way they would have kind of let down their guard. But when, when you have them look the other direction, generationally, so to speak, all of a sudden they're being held to the standard of, 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 of care for those who come after. It's equal to about 1.618. By involving um, teamwork, creativity, script making, video, teaching lessons. Science becomes a form of communicating and interacting with the world. And the school is getting results. 44% of the students scored proficient or above in the state's science test. That's four points above the state average. And 95% of the graduates enroll in two or four year colleges. But there is always resistance to change. There's often questions about whether the work that we're doing is replicable into the broader public school system. Uh, in fact, we believe that our practices and what we do can be a model for public schools everywhere. And we uh, set out to show that this same practices can get great results for traditionally underserved students in urban environments. So when I talk to teachers about what we're doing, what we're doing, we talk a lot about you know, the, the transforming of the lives, um, which is huge um, and drives me, you know, every day to get up and try to make a difference. Improving science education in the Bay Area's classrooms is a tall order. Proposition 13, which capped property taxes, remains popular with voters. Experts have floated the possibility of establishing a state tax on services to raise money for education. But critics note that more money doesn't always mean better results if teachers aren't trained and their lessons well-developed. And if the red, white, and blue of the space race is no longer a motivator for funding the sciences and fueling kids' imaginations, perhaps the need to create a greener environment might be. Whatever the trigger, it's clear that the current state of California's science education needs rethinking. If the next generation lacks science literacy, 
they'll be confronting a complex future, a future that will increasingly rely on them for answers. Next time on Quest, giant ground sloths, saber-toothed cats, Colombian mammoths. It's not Africa, it's your neighborhood. 20,000 years ago, Quest journeys back in time to a long-lost Bay Area full of surprises. And solar eclipses have been the focus of awe since the dawn of civilization. And even today, they continue to provide important scientific information about our sun. Quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.